some of you are still there. Good. Right. Good sign. Okay. So, uh, do you think that's just what happens to my accent when I try to use Siri? Really, is a complete fail apparently for anyone from Scotland or Australia. So, not working. Thank you, Siri. Right. Um, I get to do. I get to go to a really terrible meeting. So tomorrow, um, I have one of the classes free, which I will greatly enjoy being at, but I think I want to move up this hour, which is ahead in 12 minutes. Okay. Um, so that's what I'm talking to you guys. But anyway, so, uh, yeah, so office hours tomorrow over at Fowler Hall down the Trinity campus, uh, 12 to 3, so it's just before 6. Uh, let's see. Okay, so it's one thing. Okay, so I have results from those little estimates you guys did the other day. Um, and I think I'm going to manage to be able to do this. So I'm, you know, roughly for the first, uh, first part of the course, a little bit of fundamental kind of basic background or overview type stuff on the Tuesday, a little bit of that, and then more of the um, you know, working through real problems and solving real problems. Uh, so the, uh, on the Thursday. But it's, We'll see how we go. Um, I'm definitely changing around the order of things. So there's going to be this power wall stuff, figuring out where they come from, big stories about many different systems, kind of universality feel. Um, and then we'll move on to some other areas, networks being the next big thing. Okay. All right, so you guys are young and good people, right? You when you're young, you want some money spread around when you're older, and it's kind of okay, you're kind of averse to that idea. There is a paper from about 2001, 2002, which shows that, uh, which, which has the kind of finding that the people who think most like economists are apparently um, fit into these categories. They're male, they make lots of money in the last five years, they expect to make money in the next five years. So economics makes sense to me. It's quite, I could, if you're interested, I'll send you some scientific work. Some by economists. Um, it all makes sense, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we have these uh, these, these findings from uh, this work by Norton and Harley. And so this is the true breakdown of quintiles of wealth in the US at a particular point in time a few years ago. This is what people in their surveys estimated to be. This is what they ideally thought. And so you guys, we had some variation based on demographics. It wasn't that big. So this is what we have for you guys. I've just ordered it by the uh, size of the first one, so these are these guesses, right? So we went from 40 up to you know, quite an outstanding uh, inequality situation at the top. A um, couple of little things to notice is that sometimes they didn't ask for 100. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't part of the test, but I guess it's inadvertently important. Um, and the average is up the top. So you guys were a little more extreme than closer to reality. I mean, you know, I guess some of you know the game. So with these kinds of estimates here. Um, I mean, the whole Occupy story, right? So, you know, 1%, 99%, it's trying to frame this a little bit, but it's still very confusing. Yeah. Um, 1% is still, you know, it's not a big fraction. And it's not a, you really want to get to the point out of 1%. Okay, all right. So, that, and this is the ideal one, which you can see some of you are still. Save the world. Um, <laughs> out of you, and then, we'll, and then we have 30. So these were these, this, this is sort of more in tune with, uh, with this other group, completely different people, uh, but a little more skewed overall on average. So we get a few more technical damage here with the average uh, breakage. There's also the couple of times where the numbers went the wrong way, and so, so it's okay. It's okay. Quintiles have to go down. All right, so, but that was, uh, okay, so well done, people. Did a good job of estimation, and uh, your belief in the, in, in the goodness of the world is there, although there was some sort of crushing kind of. So this is, this, this is a sort of a reaction, I think, of you think you'll be in this category if you want it to be like that. I don't know what was in people's brains. Of course, it's all jumbled, so I don't know who is who. It is you. All right, so I'm going to finish this section on power laws. Of course, we're going to talk about this stuff 
a Vic, and you have uh, many problems to work on. Okay, so the last thing we'll get to, we're getting for some sort of the technical results. I want to say, let's just go a little bit um, with more before this slide. But this is kind of a big deal here, right? So if this exponent gamma is between two and three, we have an infinite variance and a finite mean. So most of the time when we're sampling from this distribution, nothing huge comes out. Down then, very big things come out. And so that's the, the surprising, dangerous kind of situation. Many real distributions have this feature. We'll look at one in the next few weeks, uh, maybe next week, that uh, actually has gamma less than two. So it's much less, right? So the average guy is actually very large. The variance is incredibly large, but the average guy is large. And it's a very natural, uh, reasonable, reasonably attained, it's not completely pathological strain. It's just, uh, you know, we haven't contrived too much to get to that, that kind of distribution. It appears. Um, okay, so the last slide I showed you was about this feature as well. So if we're sampling from these distributions and has these sort of gamma, then this largest guy after n samples is going to be typically growing like n over 1 and the gamma minus 1. Right? So gamma equals 2, that's n to the 1. Uh, gamma equals 3, that's n to the half. So this is going to be a considerable growth. So you, again, it goes to this story of, um, of you know, the this story of surprise. Right, with Gaussian distributions, exponential distributions here, the largest guy grows very, very slowly, and the distribution fills in. Now and then you get someone that's bigger, but, but by a very, very small amount as well. Right, so some other features. We have to connect these parallel distributions to another very well-known type, which is the um, dip been some confusion about this probably for sort of 40 years, and then uh, I mean, it's been connected now and then, but people we see uh, at times don't realize they're connected. There's a paper, there's a famous paper from Luthos, Luthos, and Luthos about the, uh, uh, the, the structures of web uh, about 2000. So it was actually um, at the New York City. And I think they just like, I don't know, maybe two of them don't do any work in the other one, else, but, yeah, which is fine, right? But, um, no, they, they, they're all scientists. Anyway, so, uh, so they have these distributions and they, they're treated as separate things, but we'll show that they actually have the same thing. Uh, okay, so parallel size distributions and what are called dip distributions. That's where we're going for the next little piece here. Yeah. Alright, so a very useful thing for other distributions as well, but particularly these parallel decay, these distributions that have a parallel decay in the tail. Long tail. Once again, when you look at a linear scale, these distributions are just, there's nothing there. They're very strange. Very strange. But there's definitely something there when you sample the tsunami or the earthquake that is out there on the space. All right. Um, in a very bad way. Okay, so when we look at these, these so called complementary cumulative distribution functions. All right, so the cumulative distribution function, let's say we have some function, some uh, variable that's distributed on. x equals zero to infinity, then the what we would call the f of this guy is the integral from uh, zero, uh, let's just come here, zero to x. So it's the probability that x is less than or equal to um, so the sample is less than x. from this distribution, which is described as this PDF. Okay, so this is the PDF, probably the density function, and the PDF, cumulative density function. Useful things. Again, integration, as we've seen in other areas, presumably is a smoothing thing. Differentiation puffs stuff up, makes it messy. So it's smoothing, so it's helpful. Alright. So we, so this is our, um, a sample is greater than or equal to x, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a complementary story. Okay, so it's going to be 1 minus the typical CDN. I'm just writing this guy up here. This is a normal case. Normal uh, CDF story. This guy. We want the. Uh, oh, okay. We 
want the uh, complementary one. We'll see why. All right, so uh, we're integrating from x1 to infinity. Alright. Sorry, next to Okay, so we've got this integral, we'll set it up. There's a uh, constant that we had floating around here, so we're just going to do this a lot. This is just a horrible theoretical physics thing to do. If you're a mathematician, you're probably a little bad at this point. You fall into the corner. And say, why did you do that? And then 30 years later, they figure out it was okay, and they said it was okay, and they said thank you. Alright, so this is the way physics and math works. Alright. Um, sorry, sorry. Okay, so we go from x to infinity. This is our guy in here with the, with the power that has this power of k. Okay, so x times the minus gamma. So that's an easy integral to do, right? It's just a polynomial thing here. Just a power. So you go this, you go from minus gamma to minus gamma plus 1. Minus gamma plus 1 at the bottom. And we evaluate it x and infinity. Now, so providing gamma is greater than. One, then this thing is still decaying with x, so that's fine. So when it's when it's value of infinity, this disappears. Right, so it's just x. So we get this. Right, when it's just an x, there's a there's a constant at the front, so we're going to replace that by another one of those little tongues. So that's a tongue, proportionality. Um, and it's x to minus gamma plus one. So we started with p of x behave, behaving as x to the minus gamma. This complementary cumulative distribution function behaves as x and minus gamma plus one. So it's the same type of beast. Very nice thing has happened is that uh, we just moved the exponent by one. And as you'll see from the data point of view, this is a smoothing operation. So this will be a smoother thing to look at. It'll be a cleaner thing to look at. We looked at some earlier on the other day, 500 years ago on Thursday, psychologically. And then um, it was it was messy, it was a bit messy. Right? Smooth it out, and we're going to be able to uh, measure our exponents because we're desperate to find these exponents. Desperate. All right. So this is our toxicity dx. All right. Uh, okay. So when we have tail follows the power level, we're good. Here's the exponent by one. Here's an example. So here's a PDF. This is again for the brown corpus, which is about a million words. Again, it was the uh, right. So you put the size of things. In this case, it's how many times the word kit. Five to seven times as the size. Uh, so, the number of words appearing some uh, percentage of time, it decays and then goes into a bit of a mess. Because down here we've got one word that appears so many times, and there's one word that appears so many times. And so we get two, three, four, we start to see some of them match up with each other. So, these are, this is pretty bad. You wouldn't want to try to draw a straight line through here, unless again you were a physicist, because they do that sort of thing. Statisticians are upset. Right. Okay. Very tribal, the whole thing. So, if you create the CCDF, then this guy is the system. So, very nice. So, this point out here is now this point over here. Because uh, what we're looking at is right, what's the probability that something is greater than a particular value? Well, what you'll see is related to the number, simply the number of uh, objects in the, in the distribution or in this. In this uh, ecology that appear more than that, that word. So that's what we'll do. We'll get to that. Okay, so you can see we have a nice straight line that goes down much further over more orders of magnitude. This is really one order of magnitude, so any help that scrambles itself. Here we can see a couple. So that's, that's a good thing. I just generally want three orders of magnitude before you can start writing another poem about the straight power of these things. Right? Okay, so not Okay. Very nice. Okay. So that's not that. So that's what we're doing. Uh, discrete variables work the same way. We do an equally nasty thing. Uh, we're just going to sum now from from k uh, find from k to infinity. So we're going to find the probability that our sample is greater than equal to some k because they add up all the probabilities. Uh, k going up above uh, k point going above k. And that's going to turn out the same way. This is a decaying as a, uh, a power of k to minus gamma. The way you figure it out is by approximating uh, with an integral. I think it's the same story. Right? Little nasty, nasty things to do. Uh, we often do this to 
get a good feel for things. So, sun turning into a bit just to touch on that. Alright, so zip. Let's talk about zip. So that's a good thing. So we can see uh, this little trick, if you like, will help a lot of power rules in terms of just measuring them, looking at them. Uh, kind of an elegant, quite an elegant thing. Uh, I suppose it's been really used a lot in the last 10 years. Sometimes it's called the exceeded probability. Uh, it's a lot of Alright, so zip. And I'll, I'll have another little set of slides on this because it has some absurdly amusing things in this, in this magnum opus of this. Which I keep, keep calling a magnum opus, it really is. So he, he's done all these great distributions for all sorts of things. Word frequency extent, so he's a linguist. Uh, thinking about the usage of language by children, by adults, by the kind of words they use, what kind of words, how that changes with age. And then he started to look at all sorts of other stuff. So cities in particular, what are the populations of cities? How much stuff is exchanged between cities? And clearly we love to turn around. But this is in terms of freight, for example. Right? How much freight has been moved between different cities? How much are, uh, uh, is a newspaper in a city talking about people as a function of how far away they are? Or things that happen as a function of how far away they are? Um, I think he took some graduate students to try and kind of tell to um, go through all this, this data. It's all done by hand. Okay, so this is his, his book. Um, and now it's a classic range kind of thing. We'll talk about it later. Um, but this is because, so he, so these other, this other way of looking at these kinds of data sets is become named up. This is the first one we're going to out. I mean, I was pointing out in a big way, I guess. Okay, all right. You'll hear Yule is another name here. Yule goes, and I'll, I'll connect this back to Yule later on. Uh, this is in the 19. Sometimes you'll hear you'll zip Pareto distribution the pipe mate for everyone in. Okay. Alright. So, this is a simple thing to do. So given a collection of entities, rank them by size. So take all the cities in the US and then just rank them by size, the largest to smallest. So one, two, three. So on the x-axis you just have the inch one, two, three, four, five. And on the y-axis you put the size. And you might wonder again. Just naively, and we have something like this funny distribution now, how that might look. So it's just one, two, three, four. So the same as these city sizes. You know, on, a lo on a linear scale, we look kind of drop down like this. Cities are a bit tricky because they're really agglomerations, essentially. You want to look at what the city is from space to get some better idea, or you can think about the political boundaries. Um, so people might say Boston only has uh, 100,000 people. Five million six million people. So how does this work? Well, it turns out it has that kind of same ridiculous drop. Right? So one of these are all decays, uh, and this should be connected to our um, size distribution for it as well. But it's a different way of framing it. So X will be the size of the arc ranked entities. Right? I reckon one of the largest size. Um, so it might be the frequency of occurrence of the most common word in text, which is in English, almost universally Z. It's large enough to text the words in Z. And so this observation repeatedly was that the decay, uh, the, the size of the up of the decay, the, the rank sort of minus up. It's a bit different now, right? Before we had probability on this axis and then size on this axis. Now we have size on this axis and then number rank. The probability of counting is very often basically the same thing, right? There's lots of connections between prominent <laughs> probability and insanity. But the, the first two are the ones you should worry about. Um, so uh, we'll, 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 we'll force on those connections later on with random walks as well, because it's just worth it. Counting is good, super counting. Right. Um, okay, so this is his observation. Let's, uh, let's have a look at this. So we have, this is the I'm throwing both of these out to give you a comparison. So this is this is the CCDF thing that we just figured out, the complementary cumulative distribution. So this is the uh, well, it could be probability or frequency. So this is the number of objects that we in uh, Q. Q here being the, the percent of the total set of words that are a particular word. So it maxes about five percent of these. Uh, this is the log of that percentage along this side. 
along the x-axis. So now we have this thing. Either this is uh, the bit store, so we have rank i. Uh, and you see it cleans up as we get out to the tail. So it's probably hitting some words as we go further out, but that's enough. Uh, so this is b. Right? Log 10 of 1 is 0, so this is b. b appears here. The and of and so on. So they're a little bit funny, but they're kind of in this line. And then, right on. If you stare at these things for a while, there's something interesting about them. This is kind of five six to figure this out a little bit, but it's not, it's not too bad. Any observations? So it looks like it's kind of up to this one. Great. So this little guy here. Okay. So, something is going on. So as I said, sometimes you, you will see papers going back maybe before 2000, they simply present the same information in front of you. So these two features in this data. But the exponent of this should be connected with this. So this is size, <coughs> size here, um, count here. This is a kind of count here inside this. Okay. So they're related, there's a repeat. Um, this is the flip, which you suggested. So this is flipping this. Uh, these two axes, nothing else. And you can see that they're uh, nicely connected. Yeah, so it's a moving one. All right, so we need to figure out what that is. Um, so here's a little explanation. So if we have, if we think about probabilities again, so this is the CCDF. Probability that uh, our sample is greater than or equal to N. Right? Pick one guy out at random. We multiply by N the total number of the uh, population, and that gives us a frequency. So that's a count. So we'll send it a count. So there's some sense of a finite number, which will help us. So we can think about this a little bit. So, so we have an object, we're looking at it, it's got size x, we call it x sub r. Then this number is in fact its rank, right? So this preceded probability, the complementary cumulative distribution, evaluated at that uh, size, multiplied by n, that gives you uh, the total number of objects that are greater than this guy. And so counting back from that very biggest one gives you the rank. This is rank is defined in that way. So in fact, that's the rank, so we can connect these guys and we can say, all right, the size is going to be proportional to r to the minus alpha, which is this, uh, this is the size, this is the uh, bit problem. Size is proportional to length. And we've got this alpha in here, that's the exponent we'll use for this distribution. So we've said that rank is uh, equal to this number, so we we'll put it, we we'll just dump it in there, so we're replacing rank by uh, expression in terms of the complementary cumulative distribution. And then we know something about how this guy behaves, so a little bit of a trick. Um, we know that the, this guy decays as. We know that um, probably it's greater than or equal to x r or whatever it is. Yeah, let's just say x to start with. Probably it's greater than some size. It's going to be uh, proportional to x to the minus gamma plus one. So pair of thumbs in there. That's it. Besides with the math, you have to pick it up with a pair of thumbs. Um, where Robert was. Okay, so, um, so we're going to replace this whole thing in here by uh, XBR minus gamma plus one. So this just becomes with the proportionality that the root system will eat, the root system will be the same, that's not really bad. Okay, we're interested in the scale, some stuff. Sometimes it matters in a really tight system, but tight system get good. So, but usually we sail on for a while until we're all up. Um, we therefore have this because we have x out of proportional blah 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 blah, so it's x out to this blah. Okay, so this guy, so this somewhat close to the argument, says that this is to the power of 1, so this thing here must be, the power, must be equal to 1. So 1 is equal to this uh, combination of these guys, and so we have alpha, which is 
the exponent for the zip distribution is equal to 1 over gamma minus 1. And the gamma comes from the uh, size distribution. Uh, okay. All right, so just to point out our interesting guys that we have when, here, when gamma is 2, we have alpha equals 1. So that's at that limit of where things go uh, crazy, crazy down banana pants. That's, that's, that's a bad situation, so just give it a sense of it. When out gamma is 3, we have alpha equals a half. So it's actually a more shallow component. Uh, that's something you have to think about with these guys. So it's minus alpha, so a smaller alpha means that the uh, on, a, on the log log scale, it's a sh more shallow, uh, uh, so a heavier scale, and the, the scaling is more shallow. Uh, as the exponent increases, it drops down, it's, it's not as heavy, bad things don't happen to them. So they kind of go off into each other, right? So gamma increases even more than alpha goes to zero. Say that if you rank everything, the scaling is pretty minimal, they're all similar size. Uh, alpha goes to zero, there's not so much scaling, so these things are all the same size. So some of you suggest this is an ideal world where everyone has the same amount of money, that corresponds to alpha equals zero. But at the same time, gamma is infinity, right? So everyone has the same amount, no big guy. Alright, and you, you can get down to in principle, get close to uh, gamma equals one, uh, pretty strange. But say gamma equals three halves, alpha equals two. So it actually does go both sides at once. Right. So, so you can you can measure this guy, you can measure this guy. It should be connected. Both of these are smooth kinds of distribution, and uh, we've seen that from very clearly from the complementary cumulative distribution because it's integrated. Smooth. Uh, the same thing happens. It's not so obvious because you're ranking things. <coughs> you have a nice smooth distribution, but they're both inherently smooth. So good to measure those exponents. All right. So here's the last bit. So I like statistics, and we have a random strand in the void. So um, this guy is like figured a long time ago, and you all love to go know that. So, um, so if you like focus any time, this is kind of possibly even if you don't. So these are the averages, but it's a very good thing. These are the averages for the place. So that's like a long time, and some of the fiction on how game gets played. For some reason it still runs for me, it's just okay. So it's very hard to average in your career over six months. Right? This is six months. Very few people have done it. Three people have done it. Um, so you don't see this very much. Sometimes you see this in, in natural phenomena. Very unusual. Sometimes you see this rare outliers, but this is in fact this guy's average to a positive degree. So this is a very strange thing. So it's a very uh, odd thing that's happened in this game that usually you talk about, there's always except for graphs, right? There's always sort of a bit of statistics except for this guy. So most of the games, you know, Jeff is here, or Jules is here, they're, they're, up the other, they're up here, but they're, you, know, you can kind of see where they sit on. Alright. So that's good. Um, Later in the course, we'll talk about success. So, is the Mona Lisa like some right? Is that you know, what? This is obviously an example of great success. So, and it's not nice. where success and failure are going to be resembling in the power distribution. Um, and certainly, in sales of things and popularity of things, you can see that the early two distribution, Harry Potter, and so on, is very, very skewed. Is it is the best games winning out? How does it look? How do they win by so much? So we'll get to that later. All right, so that's, uh, there's also the reference report as well. Um, it didn't work. That's the idea. So now you know a little bit about your, your dangerous, you know a little bit about power laws, you know they're everywhere, hopefully. Um, and I'm going to go back to talking about uh, complex systems in general. So I can this work, this should be a little. All right, so I had this story, okay? I had this story the other day about uh, complexity. And we're scientists, where we sort of forget where we are in, in that history of things a little bit. We live in our little tribes and so on. But we have had this incredible transition in the last 300 years to actually doing science in a big way. Uh, and, and a huge part of it has been finding the fault people. That's, that's not what this person obviously 
great work in the past. This is the idea of reductionism, fundamental scientific speaking of, of systems. It's absolutely crucial, of course. It's crucial. Um, there's a sort of a, a ridiculous knock that people have against, well, that's the reductionist argument. Of course, I mean, you have to integrate things down. Uh, and very often we're interested in understanding how these small pieces interact with each other to give macro behavior that's, that's different. Um, qualitatively different to what we might see in the market. Okay, so um, we'll go beyond this because we're trying to understand natural systems, the systems we've accidentally created, like power grids and so on, um, financial systems, like we've built over time, that uh, can have you know, good and bad behavior. So the Boeing is, is an example, so the large planes is a usual example. I think I might have a budget uh, that people will try out, right, because they've become, they've surpassed anyone's individual understanding of them. You, a long, long time ago, you'd build your whole plane by yourself, and possibly get killed doing so, but, you know, uh, you would, you know, you'd have one person knowing everything about it, and they could pull the engine apart, all those sorts of things, right? But now, of course, even with cars, and computers, and craziness, and modular, uh, it's very impossible to do that. Uh, so we've just had this example of the Boeing, whatever number, number, number it is, um, the, the new one being um, grounded because they have a, a system failure. Right? The, the battery, these batteries, which apparently were somewhat controversial to put in, so they put in these very large flying tubes, which is what they are, um, uh, have failed, right? So they're all, all catch on fire. Uh, um, but it's a good example of not really knowing what's going on. I remember, I was, in fact, I gave a talk at Boeing, at Boeing Central Institute a few years ago in Dell, and one of the, and I was talking about contagion, one of the, one of the engineers was you know, talking about the, the problems they face where they build the next, they keep building, 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 the engineers are people who do good things, things work, and then they cross some threshold that their previous equations have written, the existing equations don't hold, uh, whatever it is, something goes too fast, some instability is going and of course you find that out, you solve it, keep going, but, um, I think we're getting to a point where it's hard to predict what's going to happen, but you can try to build in immune systems and so on you know, early on. That's what we're trying to do with, say, the spark grid, for example, is trying to create some sort of immune system thing on top that doesn't take over the world and become uh, uh, you know, self-aware. Uh, you want something that uh, does a good job of uh, sort of healing and solving. Uh, we see these examples all the time in biology. Uh, you know, maybe we can build them in Systems as we go forward. Alright, so, so we're in a we're in a very, very interesting area. We have data coming out uh, of our ears, and uh, that's only going to get more and more. There are fields that transition greatly. You know, the astrophysics only changed in 2000. Biology of course changed uh, you know, somewhat before that, but, but not much longer uh, before that. So very different kind of skill sets are involved. The drum, the All right, so, <clears throat> okay. so let's look at the data story. Um, right, we're in this age of the So here's the data story. Uh, from a few years ago, this is from The Economist, uh, which is always amusing to read. Englishmen say we think about everyone else usually. Um, often somewhat accurately, which is a problem. Uh, so let's see, so this is from 2010, in fact, so three years ago. Here's an estimate of where we're going. That's the available storage information created, a lot of stuff is not being kept. Uh, uh, this is an estimate for this year, so we'll see how it turns out. We're getting up to a better part of uh, this is the future, right? This is uh, every autobite. So there are, uh, we're, we're trying to create words for things that we can use the other part of things, but it's kind of the same. Um, and then we'll have to make new words, right? So we have terabytes. So terabytes means monster. Right? That was it. It's supposed to be. Giant. I mean, when I, my first, my first uh, the laptop that took me through my whole PhD was an 800 mech. And I had legs and windows and all sorts of things. It was just a particle joke in the corner of the thing. So, so, so you all know about this. You, everyone's living through this. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider, which may or may not destroy the universe, uh, they're getting 40 terabytes a second. And they throw most of that away, right? While they're trying to create a black hole. I'm sure something's going to be. Anyway, but that's question of that. 
So they, they, sort of, they kind of know what they're looking for pretty well, so they, they can probably log it away. Uh, that's happening to some extent with uh, astrophysics and astronomy probably as well. Facebook is going to keep everything about you, your person. Uh, Twitter does, doesn't quite, they're, they're getting better at holding on to things, they're pretty good at not doing that because it's about beyond their wildest dreams, I think. Obviously, if they call it Twitter, they can catch it. Okay. Um, but they're, they're good people. All right, and Twitter is very bad, but it's very straightforward. So, good thing. All right, so lots and lots of data. I'm sure this is out there. It's ridiculous amount of data. So this seems to be true, growing and growing all the time. We're not going to keep it. Uh, and I think it's the, which one is it? NSA, maybe, is building some thing that can hold a zottabyte of data out in Utah somewhere out in the plane a lot of installation straight out of the TV show, right? Um, but, yeah, there's a lot of data there. And then it'll be useful for five years later. So, what I, uh, I mentioned, ter I, sort of terabyte being a monster, obviously, uh, beyond that, it's too much comparison to realize. So, two things, a terabyte for a larger Congress. Uh, so, larger Congress, by the way, is trying to collect tweets. This happened to start a few years ago down at an NSA conference in Warren Coast Atlas, but, but they said, oh, okay, we want to, so it's going to become the micro blog of records, right? So the New York Times is the paper of records for the US, Twitter is going to be the micro blog of, of records. We want to keep all those tweets, but um, I will say it provides an extraordinary insight into the tonight. <laughs> so, uh, there are words on Twitter that you can never, ever, ever see in the New York Times. So, crazy ideas, concepts. It's an important addition. But they have no idea. They still haven't done it. They can't do it. It's a mess. So much data. We have a lot of it here. A half of it. Uh, it keeps, for example, office work. Today. Uh, let's see. So, Google puts over, they have a petabyte per hour. Um, they have to talk about themselves. 10 billion copies of the economist. That's an exabyte. It's kind of a reasonable thing now. Zettabyte, that's where we're getting to the web now, and a yottabyte is 10 times as much again. So clearly we're going to have to keep adding. So, some sort of work is up, so we're, we're, we keep going. Alright, so this section here is just, well, you know, if you didn't know about data and be excited about data, I hope that's right. This is just to sort of show you some of the crazy things that are available. Uh, this is a paper that appeared a few years ago now. I think it was in the winter. Uh, many people working together. Uh, this is Google Books, uh, or the Engram structure uh, that's put together. So they've been, uh, Google has been stealthily uh, scanning books for a long time and turning those things into, into digital data. Uh, we have these conferences now with text as data, that sort of thing. Uh, so let's see. So. This is based on everything that so just brought everything together that they get their hands on. So it's a little bit of a messy thing. You have to play with it uh, to see what's really in it. Uh, there are there are subsections like fiction, English fiction, for example, and then many other languages as well that can help you get a benchmark. So this is just simply, for example, this one. This is mentions of the year. I think it's 1983, 1910, and 1950. Just how often those words appear in text, right? Normalized by the number of uh, text. So they have this kind of nice story here that, um, I mean, this, this is, again, more data, more insight, potentially, more things to look at. This is how much the, the 19, uh, 1883 was mentioned, and it keeps around until 1883, and then tails up. But it has this longer tail compared to the years that come in the future. And so there's a sense that the present is more important, and time is going on, this is about cultural memory, it's limited of it, uh, but it tails away more rapidly. So there's a sense of compression of time. Oops, that sort of fits with our sort of little just sort of story of, of uh, cultural evolution. It could be that much of this is scientific literature, because they've just shoved all that in as well. And scientific literature is literature is absolutely working on this. As well as you look at the half life of, of uh, journals and ideas, all those things are in there too. Uh, this uh, there are a couple of other examples. This is about suppression. Uh, so this is a uh, Talking about, I think that's Matisse. This is Matisse in, in 
uh, German literature. So you can see that in the midpoint here, this is the Second World War, nothing talks about the Russians. So you can, you can pick up it, and Picasso is in here, I think, and so on. So this is the Suppression Index, and this is English versus German. All sorts of things. It's a very rich paper. You know, many people have to sort it out. Later on, I suppose, this is a, as a point of eight individuals. They've picked out uh, famous individuals from different areas and looked at how much they just talked about the book. So you see uh, political figures, when they get to about 60, that's when they take off. And that's uh, they're the ones that get the highest kind of uh, reference on average. These are authors here, mathematicians are done. Okay. Um, this is enough to last for you. Okay. Uh, uh, and this is a, again a kind of a, a story about how much uh, individuals are talked about over time. So they take off and then there's a half life. And then. So lots and lots of other things in there. Um, but opening up the social uh, social story. All right. So Lord Kelvin, famous physicist. Uh, to measure is to know. Right. And it's basically that we're going to describe it. Uh, we kind of gone, we sort of raced past that in many disciplines and said, well, now it's called that theory. That's why theory, uh, but theories are hard to talk for, and you have to describe the world first before that happens. If you think about this. And I need a list of these, but all the now seemingly ridiculous ideas in physics. Thousand years we were fixated on the idea of circles for uh, uh, for the planets. Didn't work out. We got very upset. But the planets you think were snakes, and in fact it is. Uh, but you think were snakes for saying uh, stars, and suns as well, and also that was a long time. Uh, the, the ether, the distance. I mean, it's just an enormous list of things that people came up with. Even phrenology was a big deal. What? Well, we got it. So, now we think it's all very silly. We do internal phrenology now. Uh, okay. So, the big deal. Um, you can't measure it, you can't prove it. So, that's, uh, that's a good one for engineers, because engineers tend to get excited about things they can measure, which is fair enough. Uh, an example I often give is, you know, they'll make a brain traffic system where everything flows very well, but no one wants to live there because it's full of You know, I'd say the, the things that you maximize um, are the measurable ones, and you tend to forget about this stuff or ignore it. And certainly after a few generations of uh, research, you tend to uh, end up focusing on, on the measurable. So part of, that's part of one of our, of our absurd uh, enterprises in our group is measuring happiness. We're trying to add that to the list of things. So survivor bias is a good point. We also said things like this. Empirism proves to be a hoax. Reasonable statement of science. And they also said there's nothing new to be discovered in physics, all that remains is more and more precise measurement. So quantum theory and then chaos theory later on. We've been rather surprised um, additions to his uh, understanding of things. Very smart guy. But, uh, got a little carried away with measurement stuff. All right, so I threw this in here because uh, this is just the scientist. This is the term scientist. This is 1870. Yeah, but it doesn't, this is again, this is the group of engraft it doesn't really exist before that, right? In fact, was coined as a term in about 1874, you can understand it, by a rampaging uh, professor at Oxford. He was trying to come up with some term. The mathematician had been around for a long time. Uh, I mean, you see these other ones, like the biologists and physicists and sociologists, uh, the ists, that was their kind of It's very hard to be called a scientist. Do it very broadly, but once you get into science itself, like which which tribe do you belong to? I don't know. Anyway, you guys should be scientists. All right. Um, so emergence. Emergence. So this is the uh, very profound uh, aspect of many systems is the macro behavior that's not at all. Contained in the, in the microstructure of the planet. You take out a water molecule, do everything you want to that, but um, understanding how water flows and behaves later on is a reflective of a very different system. So it actually comes from uh, fossils, right? So it's, it's coined back in 1875, which is a recent kind of term. Um, so systems theory and science is the philosophy. Uh, 
Uh, it refers to the way complex systems decided to arise out of multiple of relatively simple interactions. Um, still somewhat controversial kind of thing. People get a little tripped up on this. It's not honestly such a big deal. It's a good term for something that happens in nature all the time. Something we try to engineer. All right, so here's a nice example. This is our man, Strogat. Will it work? Very bad thing. I'm just going to say I hate Adobe, and then I'll start again. All right. And you, you heard that, right? Yeah. Very tricky. Okay, so this is Steve Strogat, Zach Cornell. My personal history with him is I came to the MIT to work with him. Um, I walked in the, uh, the front door, essentially, and said, uh, where is his office? And the person there said, Cornell. So um, <laughs> he famously didn't get tenure there because he's a really good teacher, and he likes teaching. I mean, there are other reasons. They're crazy people. But uh, he was one of a sequence of people who exhibited the wrong thing, which is they like teaching and they're good at it. Um, another fellow who I named him, who was a Duke many years ago, won the teaching award, you know, the, the Duke teaching award. And he goes into his chair and he's like, well, you know, it's pretty good. And um, his chair says, never do that again. <laughs> so this is true, right? This is true. It is the kiss of death to show any appetite or interest or ability in teaching. It, you can be a good teacher, but only accidentally. You should take up no time. Because you should be a psychotic research maniac. All right. So Strug has a lot of... And he's become this... Right? He's, he's in the New York Times all the time. He's on Radio Lab all the time. There's a special phone in his office for Radio Lab. Big plus joke. Um, <laughs> but he has all these nice books now on... Uh, on Fireflies are... Okay. Something that we've all loved as kids, right? Catching them in the backyard, putting them in, in a jar and watching them glow. So we don't tend to think of them as anything all that mysterious. Well, they do one thing very nicely, which is flash on and off. And so far, plus two, flash. But what interests Steve Strogatz, a mathematician at Cornell University, is that there are places in the world, if not here, but in, in Southeast Asia, in Malaysia or Thailand, where fireflies don't just flash randomly, like we're used to. They somehow flash together. There are enormous congregations of fireflies along riverbanks. I mean, it, it could be tens of thousands, of thousands, tree after tree, extending for literally miles along the rivers, all flashing in sync like a Christmas tree, rows and rows of Christmas trees all wired together going off. And it's one of the most hypnotic and, and spellbinding spectacles in nature because you have to keep in mind it is absolutely silent. You picture it. There's a riverbank in Thailand in the remote part of the jungle. You're in a canoe, slipping down the river. There's no sound of anything, maybe the occasional, you know, dog, jungle bird or something. And you're looking and you just see whoop, 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 with thousands of lights on and then off, all in sync. Because no one knows. There are literally ten theories. What seems to be clear, says Steve, is there is no one firefly that makes it all happen. It just happens on its own. Order materializes out of nothing. And that has him puzzled. How can order come out of, out of disorder? And this is what the creationists love to talk about. And it's because they don't understand, and neither do we. This, this is the big, big mystery of science. I think bigger than black holes or bigger than superstrings. I mean, science has had hundreds of years of success since the time of Galileo and Newton from reductionism, from looking at the smallest parts, whether they're genes or atoms, whatever. That's great. We need to understand the individual. But that's not enough. Okay, so uh, actually Dan stuck that on top of what is really um, David Attenborough. Uh, you know David Attenborough? Very famous, uh, Sir, Sir, I'm sure, Sir, Sir, three times over, Sir David Attenborough, who uh, narrates all of the BBC, um, you know, going off into the wild and looking at things, uh, penguins and so on. Um, very anyway, so you can listen to that, Sir, David Attenborough. Anyway, terrific, grateful. 
So, a couple of things in there, right? Many different theories. And it's true that there simply are many different ways to get active synchronization. And nature is found. That's fine. And that's true of the system story in general. There isn't one way to put things together. So you have to figure them out. There are some stories that are repeated a lot, but we'll, we'll focus on those. Uh, that's certainly a project area. We, we can't cover everything. Sync is. So here's a book called Sync, um, which is a popular book, but, uh, and I think yeah, very well received. Again, he likes teaching, he likes spreading things. So, uh, synchronization is, is definitely an aspect we could work on here. All right, that thing. Okay, and I totally agree. I mean, I, I went into physics thinking, like, the grand theory of everything, that's what we should do, string theory, that's what's great. But, um, and it is okay, but it's good stuff at all scale. Fall out of the bubble. All right, so emergence, emergence. Right? So we don't find uh, tornadoes inside water molecules. It's sort of a homunculus story, right? We, we, we tend to make up this right? the financial classes aren't inside any solar bills, the human emotions are inside carbon atoms. They're manifested um, to all of these things interacting with each other in some complicated ways. Different stories. Um, uh, so but somehow we get these things, right? Fundamental particles somehow we get the universe, we get everything. Genes give rise to organisms, so there's a little code story, this is kind of physical manifestation of code, algorithms, like what? Of the mind plays a huge role. Neurons, and then we still haven't quite figured out all of the stuff that the brain at all, and then implodes it. The idea that synapses can have, uh, you know, that there's some memory being stored in all sorts of funny ways that in fact the blood flow can communicate information. This is this apparently true, right? that there's, there's actually some information being uh, processed by the uh, you know, moved by blood flow, which is insane. Not that many sources that are coming out of that. People, we've done all sorts of things. Um, we get that language is a great example. Civil language here, the rules of language, the web, of course, is this great thing now that we have. Uh, predicted by a few people, but it's you know, not so much. I have a lot of faith in this thing. Uh, so, you know, what, where does time, does time emerge out of something else? What about gravity? Some idea that these sort of come out of weird averaging thing. So, well, then worked it out, right? So we have the whole of more than the sum of its parts. That's different from the sum of its parts as well, right? It's specifically different qualitative um, rules. So it's back one way. All right. What's the key thing? Uh, this is another classic in here. Is, is, uh, I like, like social phenomena. It's another good example that tells you a few things. This is a toy model situation. Here it's done with egg. Uh, so it's shelling, mentioned him a few times. So he's a book micro, somebody's in macro behavior. It's somewhat older now, but it's, it's, it's definitely a classic. Uh, lots of different things. Talk about wearing hockey helmets, right? So when was the transition to you normal know, helmets? At some point, you know, they all do, but right enough injuries where some people just start to wear them. He, you know, he analyzes this, this threshold story of people adopting a behavior around them. Things like seating choices in, in lectures, really just trying to look at individual behavior. I might bring this up. Maybe I should. See if that works. It's two minutes. Yeah, all right. So this is Shelling Tunnel. Oh. This is a little. What's the difference? Doodling with a pen and paper and thinking about the problem of racial segregation. When he got home, he picked up a chessboard to continue his investigations. And you can do the same thing. Simply lay out alternating black and white characters, or um, brown and white days, remove any 20, and add five just to mix things up a bit. The board now represents a mixed neighborhood. And these drownings aren't extreme racists. They're happy to live in a mixed neighborhood, but they don't want their white neighbors to outnumber their brown neighbors more than two to one. The white eggs feel exactly the same way, so take any egg that is outnumbered more than two to one and move it to the nearest acceptable location. As you do this, you'll find something astonishing. The brown eggs and the white eggs will separate out as well as the blue ones. Even minor preference for the color of your neighbor can lead to extreme segregation. Thomas Schelling's chessboard experiment became
became famous, and Shelley himself eventually won the Nobel Prize. For me, the experiments are about real and racial segregation. They show how, although we as individuals may be rational and we may be tolerant, the society that we produce together may be neither rational nor tolerant. That's why the message of the logic of life is sometimes so surprising. Yes, the world we live in is sometimes irrational. What you had. Um, yeah, so this is a great example of what you can do now and then is come up with a toy model that gets at something about a much more complex system. Of course, in this case, it was race, we think about segregation in the 60s. Uh, it could be anything, absolutely anything. Um, but he, he trans changed the story or added to the story. It used to be that if you saw this pattern, you think they think applies to each other collectively. But it's arisen out of a mild um, preference for the same. Uh, and that, that changes, right? So that adds another way of seeing how things can come about. A toy model is not how things really work, but uh, there's a very important aspect to understanding complex systems where we have these toy models that at least allow, allow us to access different kinds of stories, ones that we wouldn't see because of our biases or uh, the way we tell stories naturally. Uh, Hayek, so left, so a little bit from economics, another Nobel Prize winner. Um, so it just goes on about this idea that markets and legal systems are all emergent, they're not designed, they're completely they're evolving and so on. There's some structure set up to start, there's a lot of change. And he has this good, has this good passage. Uh, this is made order, but it's imposed. Uh, imposed on as well. Uh, and then, you know, we can think of these, these limits of decentralized systems, hierarchical ones. So these are the ones you build when you have, when you solve the problem. When you're a widget making machine, whatever it is, you have some bureaucracy, you know exactly what's going to be doing. You build a hierarchy. It's, it's the archetypal idea of an army, which of course is not true. Um, I'm just very um, in, in reality, of course, they try to go from these ways as well. Uh, so, as I said, the problems are solved. Um, these ones tend to solve the problems in the first place. You may say that but these things are brittle. They're, they're, uh, you know, they're prone to collapse when, when the environment changes, when what they're doing is not needed anymore, they fall apart. So you need something that can be pointed. I think there should be like some old words around the fact that it's just like that. Exactly. Um, this is just sort of an extra bit at the end of the Hewitt Yasmol system. Right? It's very, I mean, that's, that's how libraries work, but it's a very strange way to, to build up uh, knowledge because Jew, not, this, not the Jewish from here, but it's just false. Uh, that uh, imposes their own view of the world. So it sort of it's a, evolves slowly over time, it does change, but ultimately it came out of the late 1800s, I think, in Massachusetts. So that view of the world is, is, is an awful. Uh, when you get to things like tagging and uh, hashtag and all sorts of stuff, where many it's a decentralized process of, of creating the uh, people's view of what something is, and that's a potentially much more powerful part of the So you think about the Wikipedia, of course, which is you know, knowledge, uh, encoding <laughs> knowledge, and certainly all the Star Trek conventions, but other things. Um, it's you, you said it's not a tree of knowledge, right? It's a network of knowledge, things that connect. Start to see structure emerge, uh, and that's fine. But it's something to say, I have hierarchy. Some regions of knowledge that have hierarchical uh, elements to them, but um, but to see that pop out. James Thomas, so this is from sociologists, uh, trying to move the way people connect to what uh, showing the system. Uh, so here's the idea that you have your religion, and that gives rise to capitalism, which is famous, but it's wrong. It's just that. Just trying to point out, just trying to say we well, have to think about this micro behavior as well, this is values and the economic behavior of individuals, thinking about it, this macro behavior. It's not just macro to macro. This is all very deep, it's just a very hard thing to, to get. I can measure the stuff down here. We can do it more and more and more, of course, now in the last 10 years. Uh, famous guy, I had a computer called Coleman at uh, Columbia, the Navy Line of Defense, so sociologist. So, all right. Another way to think about things. But of course, 
Once these, these, these scouts start being declared last, they're in trouble. Um, that this, this statement here, many system scales, the stuff we interact with is in trouble. Uh, even mathematics has some deep, very deep aspects that we can't, uh, of, of emergence, if you like. We can't get through every theorem this way. This is still in one way of saying one aspect of global uh, And so there's some sort of, some, people say there's a strong form of emergence, right? There's a strong stuff that cannot be analytically deduced from the, like the, the, looking at the elements of the system. Now, people get caught up on this, right? It can be done mathematically, it has some sort of flavor to it. It can be done by a computer, but it has the next kind of level of flavor. Um, and after that, it seems like magic, right? So that's this sort of funny idea we have with these different sort of things. Weak emergence. Um, where the system, system level can always differ, again, with this is the mass, but not as a part, but somehow it can be connected theoretically, and again, it can be analytic, it can be simulation. And then there's this strong emergence where you cannot somehow deduce it from the part as an interact. Uh, some people will claim, you see this in philosophy, that, that this is a real thing, um, but it's basically kind of magic, right? So, uh, reductionist thing, uh, reductionist approach to what we do is get to we can work with, right? We look at the parts, we think about how they interact, and we get to the macro behavior. Magic is quite a strong emergence. Um, but here's, so here's the problem. Um, maybe it's because I think the limits of what we can do out of this, the limits of what we can do with models, we can't quite put everything in there. Uh, so magic right, may in fact be just, just at this point in time, a very difficult mechanism to get out, can't be, uh, can't be simply described. That's, that's bad news, but it's okay. It's always very exciting to have these kind of situations. Um, and that's certainly been the case that we've unveiled uh, mechanisms as we've gone on in time. And I think I have, again, we're going to have a little bit of scroll gas action, uh, but the main person mm -hmm. here is Mike Schmidt. Uh, Schmidt gave a super nice thing over the last few years. Um, he's been running a TEDx event at UDM. And our uh, first one, uh, we had Schmidt come and talk about uh, Software called Eureka, some of you may know about it. We'll talk about it in this, this little piece here, this little Radio Lab um, excerpt, which I'm going to play. This is good. Again, it gets to these very difficult problems, right? We may be in some sort of period of time where everything works and we can write little just those stories down. Maybe we get into trouble. Hey, I'm Janet from Ron. I am Robert. Which is the radio lab, and this next segment began with a simple question. Seeing as our topics were going to be the same, so probably a few minutes of rain, now we're going to go read it. Yeah. Yeah, so we call up Steve Stroyas, mathematician at Cornell. I want to say it starts off, this whole thing starts off with um, uh, Iron Man Triathlon, right? And I interviewed a couple of people from uh, the famous people from, who, who have done horrible things themselves and trying to finish those races, right? So, um, Falling over lines and that sort of thing. They interview a fellow who won RAM uh, right across America, which is just a bad thing to do yourself. People basically go into uh, some sort of uh, 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 hallucinogenic state after about five or six days. <laughs> and there's a fellow from, I think, Croatia or something who won it five years in a row. He was killed, it, 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 tragically killed in a car crash. Um, I mean, it, he was on his bike. But he, he used to be in the military, and I just want to tell you this, it's great. But he apparently would start to imagine Russians were coming through the trees to get in, and his crew would say, yes, they are. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so whatever that, they would work with his total, you know, crazy thing going on. I think he was allowed to choose his music. And when the, he, he had a few things he was in charge of, but that was it. So they would basically say, you're right, you better keep going. Uh, he come the home, you know, and he would ride like a machine. Anyway, crazy. So it's about these extremes of human behavior. So it starts off with physical stuff, and then it ends with science. We're Steve, we've been guests on the show. And we asked him, are there limits to human knowledge? And his answer sends us in the new intention. Um, there's, well, yeah, is there anything that's at the limits of our knowledge is the question that a lot of us scientists worry about. Certainly the 20th century taught us that there are many things that limit our knowledge, for instance, that 
Heisenberg uncertainty principle in quantum physics showed us that we can't know the position and momentum of a subatomic particle at the same time. You just can't do it. It's not a matter of not having good enough instruments or not being clever enough. It's just a fundamental barrier that nature puts in your way. Um, in logic, Gödel's theorem tells us you can't prove certain things even though they're true. So we, there are all kinds of limits. So those seem a bit remote from everyday experience. And yet, I think there are really important limits on our knowledge that we're all familiar with. What I'm thinking of here is our inability to think about big numbers. Because with your fingers, you've got 10, you know, normally. So we're good at 10. We're barely good at 100. And once you start getting to thousands, millions, billions, and trillions, it gets hazier and hazier. When you hear now about the trillions of dollars in the deficit or whatever it is, the debt, you know, we don't, that means nothing. How are you supposed to think about that? Now, when you ask why can't we understand the common cold so we can put a person on the moon, it has to do with large numbers. Not just large numbers, numbers to see, but large numbers of things interacting. That there are so many genes involved and so many biochemical reactions involved. Our brains are limited, our memories are very limited, and so um, I worry a little bit that we might be approaching the end of our ability to have insight into certain kinds of questions. What Steve means by the word insight is not that we found the answer, it's like that, it's like a feeling, something like that. Oh, I get it. You need to get what you need to understand. Yeah, that satisfying feeling that I can see the reason. I can actually feel it in my bones. That's, that's a very pleasurable feeling, but um, one that we may not always be able to enjoy. <laughs> Uh, we weren't really quite sure how to deal with that one, but then Steve said, I'm going to take my own word for it. Talk to these guys who work down the hall. We'll see. Yep, we can. We can do whatever that is. Cool. Can you guys introduce yourselves? Tell me who I'm talking to. Yeah, so uh, my name is Paul Bitzer. My name is Michael Schmidt. I'm a PhD student and uh, I'm a robotic. And how did Michael develop the thing, which does make me wonder if Steve's right? It's a computer. Yes. Actually, many. Full power of computers that are all grinding away. Actually, we need to get that into the ship So they've named it. Eureka. Because that's what it's designed to do, to have Eureka moments. So let's, let's uh, maybe a, a kind of simpler example. The story of Eureka begins pretty simple. With a pendulum. Okay, the pendulum. Just one of the things that's hanging off a grandfather's clock. Okay, it's got a regular pendulum swinging around. Okay, swinging left and right. Now it says how it's doubled. Instead of a string connected to the ball, make it a string connected to a ball connected to another string to another ball. So it's basically a, a double pendulum. The cool thing about this is you just put it up, you lift it up and let it go. And what we get, says Mike, is chaos. Instead of nice and even, now you got random tones and possible things to try to predict where this thing will be. So what they did was they got the camera. But the interesting thing is that it came up with this thing without knowing anything about the theory. Nothing. That's why we kind of think that this algorithm might be able to find a new law that we don't know about. In fact, once word got out about Eureka, that's when the emails started. A couple emails a day. 
kinds of all over the place. So like, hey, you might be part of it. So what kind of film? Um, anything you can uh, think of from uh, trying to predict the behaviors of cows and the herd through particle physics to the stock market. And that's true. This is when we get the Steve's Steve's of insight. That's when we met this guy. My name is Joel Corral. Corral is a biologist. At the University of Texas Southwest University. He got me to this one. He said, I have this amazing data, which is single cell dynamics. Meaning, he said, the time we think the simple criteria in there, because he's been collecting the information on how it works, on its inside. How things go up and down, certain nutrients increase, certain nutrients decrease over time, just like the thing was. The thing is, in a cell, it's like a thousand of things. There's so many parts. Genes turn on and off. Thousands of cells, tens of thousands. Of cells. Proteins turn on other genes, nutrients going up and down. It's this crazy, quickly complicated feedback. And he wants to know inside of this cell, how are all of these things related? We can measure it all, we can see things going up and down and all that. But what are the rules? What are the rules? And this, he says, is the problem for biology. Biology is one of the least well understood systems compared to what the chemistry and physics. They're still lacking the base. So we said, look, Mr. Robot, <laughs> can you tell us what you think are some of the important principles governing this organism and maybe detect things that were hidden from us? So he sent us the data and uh, we analyzed it. And uh, Okay, so that's not the answer. What happened? Suddenly, the equations started popping out. We can do this thing. The robot came back to us and said, okay, here's a set of two equations that describe your data. Do you remember by any chance what the, what the actual equation was? Not, not that we understand it, it's just sort of here's that one. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't have my regulating skills uh, <laughs> developed to that degree. Yet. The important thing is that the equation is telling you things like when this protein goes up, this other thing always goes down. When that thing goes down, this gene turns on and goes a loop de loop. And when he went to his cell to check all this out, the equation was wrong. These equations match the data. And in fact, they explain the data. These equations can even predict what the cell is about to do. But One will check out, but we don't know what they mean. We don't know what they mean. What? Meaning they don't know why these equations work. Like why when this goes up, does that go down? Why when that goes up, this goes higher? Why? I had to first look at this and try to make sense of it. We said like, oh, okay, I think we understand. They were like, oh, maybe we don't. We think that we're close to understanding. But so now we're in this bizarre situation. We can't even publish it right now because we can't just publish the equations without explaining it. So in the end, they're in this awkward position where they've got the answer, but they don't have the insight. And I think it's a preview of what's to come in science. The more we turn to computers with these big questions, the more they'll give us answers that we just don't understand. We'll be faced with this challenge of having to find ways to get a computer to explain what it found, but that will leave us, if this really happens, in some weird position of bystander for a little, just sort of listening to the oracle, but not really understanding the answer. Is there going to be a time when we, we can't cut it anymore? We've had this, this window in human history when we could not just know things, but actually understand them. Like we could know why they were true, not just know, but to know why. And that's a beautiful moment in human history. So I, I feel like it may only be a moment. Well, I don't really see it quite that, that sort of sad and dramatic. <laughs> at the end, there will be simple principles to describe even the most complicated of processes. So you have a bias that prevents you from feeling the kind of despair that Steve feels and we're hoping you would feel. <laughs> oh, well, I, I have a positive outlook. <laughs> but I'm just wondering about the we. Look what we have discovered, you're saying you're an old man. Robot sitting there and strapped next to it. And the robot will be holding your hand and it will be a cold hand. <laughs> and Jack and I will be thinking, I don't know, who's the we here? I guess, I well, I would say we is sort of knowledge. I'm just thirsty for understanding the cold piece of knowledge. Me and the cold hand holding my hand, <laughs> we have accumulated and contributed to the overall understanding of something that we thought maybe 50 years ago was impossible. And that would be something that would make me happy. Right. <laughs>
a little despair there. Which is great. But it's very, you know, it's a real interesting thing to think about here. I will give you things at work. We'll have some of that on Thursday. Um, I'll stay on the current as well. Three, Thursday. Uh, how will size distributions get them into your heads? It's good. All right. See you on Thursday. Thanks tomorrow.